Yes, friends, it is this time of the year again, Christmas. And you know what this means. It's time for another video on this channel. And of course, I brought you a little early Christmas present and it's all about reusing logic in your Nitro event handlers without, well, putting in an extra file, but using a simple design pattern called a wrapped event handler. Let's go. No matter how you use Nitro in your project, be it as a standalone version or with a meta framework like Nuxt, Analog, and so on and so on, you probably have some kind of API routes going on if you use the full stack capabilities or have it as a standalone project. Which means, well, there is some logic involved. And in this little video, I want to show a pattern which is quite common instead of using things like middleware to make sure that you don't repeat yourself too often, keep your code dry, but still very well organized. So let's jump into the wrapped event handler pattern and see how to apply it. Our Nitro application is, of course, as minimal as possible. It's just the starting template, very easy. And then our server routes in here, right? We have index.ts, and this is just an event handler which returns content. Perfect. So commonly, when you have, let's say, a more sophisticated application, you might want to fetch a user. So let's maybe build that whole thing and say, okay, we have some kind of uh, get current uh, user functionality. And of course, this is async, so it's like we have the user and get it from somewhere. Of course, we don't want to couple our example here necessarily to a specific implementation. So no matter where we get it from, let's just say, okay, we get it from somewhere and uh, it has an ID and also a name, of course, test user, for example, and other properties. And at the moment, why not also add some types? So let's say type user is ID string and name string. And of course, if you have a user, then you often want to also check permissions, obviously. And there are tons of ways to do that, also like libraries for ACLs and so on and so on. But in our case, we simply want to do it based on the route. Every route has a permission string and then check it based on maybe what's uh, in the database, what's in the user object, and then either give permission or don't. And we can easily do that. Let's say we have a check permission function that we quickly write ourselves and we pass in the user and the permission string. As said before, this can be like done per URL, depends a bit on what you want to do eventually. But let's say here, this is just index and other ones that would be changed per route. But as mentioned, there are lots of systems possible. So in here, let's just say, okay, let's create that function itself besides the get current user one and say function check permission in here. Uh, and of course, because you want to do it very well, uh, let's change it to permission string to uh, make sure that we know this is a string and no constant. And here we have user type user. Of course, uh, as it's only an example, well, we can just say return, well, how about math.random? And then we say, okay, in case it is bigger than 0 0.5, so we have the typical 50-50 chance, then we return true, otherwise false. And we can even go further, say const is allowed. Uh, we assign that, and then we say if the user is not allowed, then obviously we can throw an error, thanks to the create error helper method and also say status code 403 and a custom message like not allowed which you could also pass in but you get the idea here so now we even run this and know afterwards so it's basically a little invariant so to say afterwards if this runs through we know okay the user is authenticated we can continue here pretty sweet but of course you don't do this only for a single route right like usually you do this for multiple routes often have multiple routes where the user has to be authenticated when there's some API calls happening. So commonly what you start doing, and that's also fine for the beginning, is you start copy pasting code. So let's say we'd have a, I don't know, a users edit.ts route and say, okay, sure, we'll do some things. Also in here, we return content, but the actual logic, like returning data, do some things, uh, actual logic is in here, right? And then we return something, this is just a dummy. So usually what is happening is you copy the whole thing, of course, fine, and this part here will change. But very often, the main part when it comes to getting the user and checking the permissions will stay the same. You probably want to change this to something like, in this case, users.edit. In our concept, at least, that also depends, of course. And now you already see, okay, these things, we, we don't really need to use them here, right? We have them 
over in the index.ts already. So of course we want to not replicate all the code. We want to have it in one space and commonly then we say, okay, let's use utils, a folder and say, we can name that user.ts or off.ts or whatsoever. I stick with user here and uh, move all of that in there. So let's move it over. Perfect. We also want to export that here to make sure this is available and also move the type over because otherwise that might be a problem as well. And here we go. We can save the whole thing. And now we have two options to include it, of course. The first one is we can just import it manually like this. Forget current user and check permissions. But also we could use Nitro's auto imports. Whether you don't want to do that, well, that's up to you, of course. And also check out my video on auto imports uh, when it comes to Nuxt. But also same applies to Nitro. The future of all of that. And uh, I'd be curious to hear if you're a fan or uh, if you rather won't see any auto reports in your application. So yeah, curious to hear that. But back to the example. And if we take a look at uh, our index.ts now, if we jump back, we see there is no import here compared to the edit.ts, right? So it's still available. Auto imports also work here fully and nicely. So either way is of course fine. And now we are at some point where we say, okay, if we check out these files besides the import, this part changes, right? This stays the same in here, four and five. This will definitely change whatever will be returned. So in a way, one could say, can we abstract this further away? And one might wonder, but well, Alex, these are like two lines of code. What, what's the problem? Can we just like create a new function out of that maybe? And yes, in a way, but in this case, sure, right now there are two lines, but there can be more. It can be depending on what you want to do. Uh, and ideally you also want to have some kind of composition available as well to say, okay, maybe I uh, have something returning me the authenticated user and then say, I want to check a permission or I always want to have the authenticated user uh, and see what will happen with that. So uh, now our wonderful wrapped event handler pattern comes in and uh, let's see how we can do that. The whole idea of the pattern is basically taking this part. We also move this to utils over here. It could even have a new file. It's up to you, right? How to structure that. And what we want to do is we want to export a function, which is basically our custom wrapped event handler. We can name it like define event handler and then something like with permissions or something like that or permissions or with uh, checked user. That's really up to you more or less how we want to name that, right? Uh, let's talk about the arguments later and first copy everything here. Of course, we can't have an export default here. So we just say we return what's in here and we already see, oh, we don't have the permission string, obviously. So the permission string should definitely be uh, an argument here, right? And there is one more thing. We have this do some things, actual logic. And ideally, we also want to have a way to say this define event handler with checked user, this should be usable the same way as define event handler. Um, but it should give a little bit more here. So what we want to do is we want to have some kind of handler function. And I type this as any for now, quickly collapse it here so you see everything. We will fix these types in a second, but it's very important that here we say, you know what, we can say return await handler and we want to call the event and the user. So we ideally say at the end, the very end, we have the option to say we define the event handler with checked user we pass in the permission string and then have our handler function. So let's replace this here with the permission string from above and let's see how that would look like when we actually use it. We just do it in the edit here. So instead of define event handler, we say define event handler with checked user. Of course, we also import that, right? Now we want to pass in the permission string as the first argument and then we have our handler function which gets the event and the user. Right now it's typed any, so that, uh, well, doesn't really work at the moment. And also because of the duplicates here, which will be gone because this is part of the define event that I have checked user, it's fine. And now the actual logic is the only thing that's left. And we're good. Of course, now the types, they have to be fixed. But other than that, that's, that's totally fine. We also don't need to know what exactly is going on. If we want to, we can always check the definition of define event handler with checked user. And in here, the logic is happening. And then we just say whatever logic comes next that is customized by you out there, that will be executed and then we're good. But yeah, now as we said, we need to do a little bit of TypeScript magic here also to make sure that our custom wrapped event handler works the same way as define event handler, gets all the right information for the request and the response. So let's look into that.
Before we look into how this actually works, let's open our index.ts before where we have the define event handler and see what the types are. Here we have event handler request as the first generic that's passed in and promise string. One thing I want to show you is that if we change the content here to something like number, like one, and hover over define event handler again, we see now it's promise and number. And same with like if it's a little object, then we say promise object and so on and so on. So we definitely see that the second one is always the promisified version of whatever is being returned. And that's pretty sweet. So we know already that if we go back to our implementation here, the second thing, our generic, and we also need some generics here, uh, let's call them, you can call them request and response or like uh, T and D, uh, D in this case for data. The data part is always related to whatever is eventually returned. So that's definitely good to know. Now we need a few more things to do there uh, because obviously our handler has the any type right now. So we have to fix that. And in the best case, we don't have to do much when it comes to setting up the generics a lot because Nitro and H3, they already help us a lot with that. So if our custom handler in here would only take the event as an argument, then we could straight away type it as an event handler uh, as it is actually available through H3. For some reason, VS Code doesn't recognize it here, but let's just import it dynamically. Import type event handler from H3. And this would work straight away. We could pass in the TND generic and we'd be kind of done. The problem is that doesn't really work because now it says, wait, that only expects one single argument. So we have to define our own type, mainly because we don't do the typical event handler structure. We add a few more arguments here. So what we want to do is we want to kind of build an event handler with user. So we want to say, hey, it's the typical structure, but it is related to the user. And also, this is just a little helper type that basically says, okay, you know what, we have our event. And that's, of course, the H3 event type. Very typical. That's also what is in here, obviously, right? But also here you see, oh, there's a generic once again has to be passed in, and that's the event handler request. So now we can say, sure, we can pass an event handler request here, but I rather put in T and give this whole thing a generic as well. So this all can be nicely inferred and say, T only has to extend event handler request. And of course, we also tagged it in. So that's fine. Now we need the user, which we know is type of user. And then we say the return type of this whole thing is promise D. Now I might wonder, okay, why D? And we don't have a D here, let's add that. Well, as we said before, the D in here is the data. And eventually you want to say everything that you do here, right? Whatever that will be, we know the return type of that, promisified, is our D, so we can pass that along. That's the data type. So now in our type here, we can say we pass in T and D, and that looks pretty okay. I would probably still also here say we make sure that this extends the event handler request. So that's also nicely typed and correct. Apply some prettier and things don't look that gnarly anymore. Lovely. If we take a look at our edit TS now, then we see that the event is actually fully typed in its H3 event. So we can do all the nice things like get router param, for example, from the event, or we see we can get the event context, uh, event dollar fetch, and so on, so on. So we make sure that all the, let's say, magic around the H3 event with, yeah, context that's available, file system based routing, and so on, so on. Um, also with the, yeah, dynamic variables, that all just works. So there's a little bit of typing necessary, but also not a big deal because you can just take it over as a little snippet or recipe. It's great, right? And now we have to check if the user works as well. And if you take a look at the user here, yeah, that's also fine. User is type of user that uh, looks great. And now you can focus on your logic here. And obviously you can even go a step further. Now we have one type of defined event handler, right? That's wrapping all of this in our user file. But we can also say we stack this. We have one that always gives the user back and then one that maybe also checks it. So in a way we can do a lot of function composition, which is pretty unique for a backend system here, especially in JavaScript ecosystem that you can say, okay, instead of running tons of middleware on top, you just say, hey, this is my event handler. And we have a few event handler on top of it that do things that provide stuff uh, or that check things and throw an error before. So even though the setup is a little bit more uh, on the boilerplate side, at least if you do it a couple of times, it will be easier. And I hope also that in the future, H3 Nitro will provide some more helpers to make it even easier. 
as I showed you before, the event handler type is there if you don't want to pass additional information. But still, I think even right now, it looks pretty nice if you have the setup once in place. You can also abstract it further away. Nevertheless, now we can focus on encapsulating logic that we want and making sure that we can compose our event handlers nicely. And I'm curious, what do you think about the pattern? Does it make sense to you or do you really have rather a big function to call everywhere? Um, yeah, so I'm, I'd be curious, what do you think about it? Uh, let me know in the comments. Uh, also, if you're interested in any other patterns, uh, please let me know. And definitely have a look at the other videos at the latest Deja View episode. Very important. And other than that, uh, I hope you have some calm and relaxing holidays. And uh, see you next week Friday, unless you're still in food coma, I guess. Talk to you soon and happy hacking. And Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas! Don't add it. Don't add it.